looking photos. Oh. So what happens when, yeah, so you get more dull looking photos. If you were to shoot just straight JPEG, the camera is actually applying its own native preset on top of it. Um, so with RAW, it's giving you literally like a digital negative. And so what I will always do is I'll start at, uh, I'll start with my exposure and use this. Guys, if you're not friends with the histogram yet, you should be. This is an indicator. This is like a, like a graphical representation of your entire photo. And so we can see if you mouse over, we have blacks, it shows up down here. We have blacks, shadows, uh, exposure, that's sort of like your midtones and then highlights and whites. And so you can see we have the most amount of the image in sort of the blacks and shadows area and then in the highlights and whites. And so where it's higher is where we have the most concentration of that. And so you can literally drag on your histogram. So I'm, I'm actually just clicking and dragging up in the, the top right. And I'm just dragging left and right. And that is changing my shadows. Um, and so I can also just do that with this slider down here. And then I can also click up here. I can bring down the highlights like that. And so I like to just get my exposure, my highlights and my shadows in the right place and looking balanced. And this is generally what uh, a histogram should look like. You want everything sort of even across the board, unless you're going for something that's a little more creative, where it has lots of darks or has lots of lights. Um, if you want like a really balanced photo, you kind of want to see a balanced histogram. Now, what most people will recommend doing is over here on the, the right panel, we, we have so many different <coughs> settings that we can change. And most people will recommend starting up here and then working your way down and making the adjustments to each one. I actually go the other way. So I always start down at the bottom and I do that for the sake of getting all of my uh, sort of camera adjustments under control first. And I just like to dial those things in and then I start working with the colors. So these are the things that are gonna affect the overall photo. Uh, and so calibration is, a, is where I'll usually start. And this is a very, very powerful tool. And what this does, what calibration is, is that every camera has kind of a different color profile. They interpret colors in different ways. So Canon has their own version of green, for example. Sony has their own version of green. Uh, Fujifilm has their own version of green. Same with Olympus. So all of the different camera brands have their own versions of colors. And this calibration panel lets you literally change what that is. So this is straight out of camera from a Sony a7 III, which is what I shoot with. And uh, a Canon photo is gonna look similar, but the colors might be a little bit different. And so you can adjust that by using the calibration down here. And so we have R, G, and B, which are the three primary colors. And the, the, my style of editing, I will usually just like pump up. I found this, this great little trick a number of years ago to just pump up the saturation a bit. I love the look when you, when you pull the blues up like anywhere from like 70 to 90. And so that just adds a nice punch. And then I'll usually try to turn the blues into a little bit more of an aqua color, a little bit more of a teal. And teal is sort of known for kind of a, uh, having a little bit of a cinematic effect, especially when you couple it with an orange color. And we're gonna get into the color wheel and stuff like that a little bit later. Um, but I, yeah, so I'll start with that. And, you know, ultimately it all depends on like, what looks good. And so a lot of this is just going to be kind of playing around. And you can see how much just making those adjustments 
changed this image. So I don't know how well are these are these edits coming across on the live stream? They are. Okay, perfect. So by just changing a couple of these sliders, the whole image has some life to it now. And so we're just going to keep working with that. And I, like I said, I will start at the bottom and I go up. So um, the effects are something that you can certainly use if you want. Um, that's actually one I might skip for now, but, but I don't know if you're doing, I don't know if you're doing a portrait or something and you want to, you know, add like this vignetting around the side, that's, that's one. If you want to add some grain, um, I don't know if that's going to come across in the live stream, but effects is something I might actually come back to later. Um, transform. So this is where I might start to uh, sort of get get the the image um, straight or you know rotate it or maybe uh, one little trick that I've learned is is maybe a person looks too sort of like sort of like short and stumpy and so um, or if I have a mountain range and I really want to like expand that mountain range. Uh, Erica, what are you laughing about? Um, this aspect slider is kind of a secret, kind of a secret gem um, where you can really like, I mean, you can, you can go way overboard by doing that, um, you know, or that. Uh, but ultimately, if you've got, let's say, a mountain range in the background, I might pull the aspect up a little bit. Let me see if I picked. So let's see. So if I take this one, and this is a photo from Yosemite that I just recently took. And so if I use the aspect uh, slider, you can see how all of a sudden that's looking a lot more sort of towering in the photo. And that's something nobody really talks about and that I had to learn sort of on my own. And so that aspect slider, total game changer. It constrained crop, which means you're not going to um, get like the whiteness on the side of the image there. Um, so yeah, that's a favorite of mine. Then lens corrections, you're pretty much always gonna wanna hit remove chromatic aberration. Um, I'm not gonna get into that right now since that's a little bit of a rabbit hole um but you'll also probably want to hit enable profile corrections and so this all depends on what you're actually shooting with and um, at the end of this i'll give you a list of uh some cameras that i really recommend like no matter where you're at in your photography journey um but this was shot with the sony 24 to 70 2.8 G Master. And so that has like every lens is spherical, right? And so it has distortion and it's going to add sort of a spherical dis dis distortion to it. And so when you hit enable profile corrections, that's sort of Adobe making an adjustment to the photo based on what it knows about that lens. And so it's going to fix any distortion or vignetting, like if you see sort of darkness around the edges, that's going to fix that. Um, and another little trick is that you can use this distortion slider here to sort of um, like pinch the, the center of the photo. And so if you have subjects in there and you want to sort of elongate them a little bit, you can use this to do exactly that. And you're literally, it's almost like a pucker. Um, and if you're familiar with Photoshop, there's actually like something called the pucker tool. Uh, and, it, and it almost replicates exactly that. And so that distortion slider is one that I really love to use just to sort of elongate my photos a little bit. Uh, detail, I will come back to you later. That is about sharpening, and um, that's something we don't want to do quite yet. Color grading, I'm actually also going to skip. Um, this is an incredibly powerful tool, and I highly recommend. There's so many YouTube tutorials out there about how to use 
the color grading panel in Lightroom, I would definitely recommend going out and doing some of that research. And, and also like what I'm trying to do here today is not talk about a bunch of, like I've watched all the videos. I don't wanna talk about the stuff that you can find on YouTube. I wanna talk about some of the stuff that you can't find or that people aren't talking about on those videos. So um, yeah, I, I, I hope for these to be slightly lesser known tips. And you know, there's just, there's such a wealth of information out there, guys. Like YouTube is an incredible place. There are paid courses, there's free courses. Um, there's just so much info out there. And so with that said, I am gonna skip over the color grading panel for now, but I will get into the HSL slider. And this is where a lot of the magic with color starts to happen. And um, let me just check my notes here. Yeah, so this is this is where a lot of the colors start to happen, and this is all really sort of a personal choice. And so for me, I know so we have hue, which is going to literally change the color of uh, what you see on the screen. So I, if I click hue here, and let's say I go to blue, blue is a pretty common one. So. I can change whatever appears on the screen as blue. If I slide this slider, this is going to change that. And so this is where, you know, if you want to get, if you want to be more artsy, if you want to be more creative with, with what you do, you know, I know people who like this is their style and they go like neon blues and neon pinks and like, and that's their thing. And they get amazing brand work. It's incredible. Uh, that's not my style. So, you know, I'll usually, bring it to sort of this kind of lighter turquoise and hue again it's it's just changing the color and so i again i don't know how much of this is going to come across uh i i think it looks look i'm getting some nods so it looks like it is coming across but this is where like so much of the magic really happens and so what i what i will say is like make sure you bring, you, you like make this panel as wide as you can so that you have the most room for adjustments here. And you wanna just get in there and, and like the, the best advice that I can offer is just play with it and learn how each one is going to affect uh, the rest of the image. And so, I'm just gonna go through just a luminance. So I wanna I wanna make that um, sky a, a little bit lighter. I don't I don't like kind of how saturated and dark that blue is. So I'm gonna drop the saturation of the blue. I increase the luminance a little bit. Um, and I'm also gonna drop a graduated filter. Let me do that slower. So okay. So across the top here, we have a few selective tools where you can make selective edits uh, to your image. And so um, one of them is a, a gradient filter. And so you can drag, and I'm gonna show the mask. And so where that red appears is where whatever these whatever edits you make over here that's where that's going to show up and so i can sort of elongate this area for a longer smoother transition or i can make it really small and tight for like a very clipped uh transition and so if i wanted to put that like right on the horizon and only affect what's above it i could do that uh, typically, I don't like to do that. Um, I prefer the edits to look a little bit more subtle. And here, I'm just going to adjust the temperature a little bit. So these sliders are going to affect, uh, you have sort of a blue, like cooler effect or a much warmer effect. And like, it's really, again, stylistic. It's however you want this photo to look. And so you have your temperature on the first one and you have your tint 
on the second one. And you can slide it down to give yourself some more greens or to give yourself some more pinks. Now, I personally love like bright oranges, bright pinks. And so, you know, I might kind of just looking at this, I actually really like this kind of blue sky, but with some pink adjustments into it. And I think that might be a little bit much, but I really like the way that's looking. And I might increase the exposure a little bit and drop the highlight. So that's, you know, a selective edit on just the sky. And you can see, you know, whether you like the way this looks or not, and all I'm doing is just clicking this little toggle right here. And, and you know, this is all just for example, but whether you like this or not, ultimately that's how you can affect just a single portion of the image. Um, and so the same thing goes with, so that's a, um, a gradient filter. You can also use a radial filter, which is gonna do exactly the same thing, but in a circle. And you can sort of drag and drop it. You can create an oval, you know, you can make it the size of the whole image. You can adjust it so that it's kind of just covering the person. Um, you know, I like to make the edits really kind of soft and so, and, and almost not noticeable. So I tend to create them a little bit larger. And I might just like pump the exposure in the middle of the image, just a tiny little bit. And that's just gonna like almost without even noticing it, the outside of the image is gonna be a little bit darker, but by like a, a minuscule amount. And it's just gonna help bring the eyes to the center of the image, which is where we want people to be looking. And, and so what's happening is, you know, the eyes get drawn to this subject here, and then they'll sort of keep following this line to see this beautiful um, uh, landscape in the background. And so what we ultimately wanna do is, is you know, direct people's eyes in that, in that direction. Um, so you can also, you know, I just bumped up the exposure. You can increase shadows. I mean, if I like really slam these sliders, you can start to see, you know, where exactly that is. But like the best thing that the best piece of advice that I can offer is to be super, super subtle with your edits. And, you know, I'll oftentimes go on Instagram and I see people's photos and I can see exactly where they've made the selective edits because they've, you know, done it too harshly or they've done it just a little bit too much. And so I like to keep that very subtle. So, um, that's how you do selective edits. You can also grab this guy over here, which is a brush. And you can literally brush onto your image. And there's a pretty cool trick. And so somebody actually asked me on Instagram yesterday how to change colors. And so if you wanna get selective and change the color of let's say my jacket in this case, um, I'm wearing a black jacket. I can make that blue if I want to make it blue. And so what I do, so first of all, guys, this is a Wacom uh, Intuos and it's just a drawing tablet. And I do link out to this um, in uh, some slides. I think we're going to pass the slides off after this. Um, this thing, it's like 99 bucks and it literally lets you just draw and it lets you control the mouse. And so um, power helps. So mine is Bluetooth. And so now I'm controlling my mouse just by moving around on the walk home. And so what I might do is with a selective edit here, um, I might decrease the size here, decrease the feathering, and let's zoom right in. And on here, I can just draw. And the red, we're going to make disappear. 
And then you can certainly do this with your mouse. Uh, it is a lot easier to do when you're just drawing it in, I will say that. So let's say, and this is a super, super rough job here. Um, I'm gonna fix up a couple of these little spots. Um, so one way, let me turn off this red now. And so what you can do, if we wanna change the color here, the first thing you wanna do is drop the saturation all the way down. And so again, this is a selective edit. So I can increase the exposure. Obviously that looks terrible. Uh, and we've actually just now turned my jacket white. <laughs> um, but but um, we can actually, that's interesting. Okay, so, um, but so, so that's what we've done. And so we can, you know, maybe bring up the shadows a little bit and we can make the edits, even if we don't want to change the color, we can make whatever edits we want to any specific part of the photo. And so um, to change the color, drop the saturation all the way down. And then this tiny little box down here, this is color. Click on that and you can pick from any color you want. And so let's say I want to go red. So I've now just changed my jacket. And this is all in Lightroom too. Like, like Photoshop is, is what's known for being the place where you make selective edits and where you, you know, do the retouching and everything else. Um, but photo in, sorry, in Lightroom, you still have some really uh, incredible options here as well. And so maybe I want to bring this um, exposure up and, uh, you know, like play with some of the contrast a little bit to adjust that color. And so, you know, now I'm wearing a red jacket and I hate that. I think it looks terrible, but that is how you would do it. So I'm just going to remove that for now, but I wanted to address that question. And so we're still going up the side panel here and, you know, you can really choose to spend however much time you want on a photo. I will typically spend it hours editing a photo and other people will spend you know 15 minutes and so it really just depends on like how dedicated you want to be how how crazy you want to get um so then onto the tone curve this is one i definitely recommend looking up some youtube tutorials on how to use this i'm just gonna um put a little slight S curve on here, which is going to add a little bit of contrast. And I'm going to bring up these two points here. Sorry, bring that one up and bring this one down. And so um, this is called white clipping up here, and this is black clipping. And so you can see if you want to like really clip the blacks and bring that up, this is how you get that super faded look that um, is often seen on Instagram is, is just by pulling that bottom little dot up on the, uh, on the tone curve. And I like to fade them just a little bit, not too much. And then same thing with the whites. And here's a little tip for Instagram, like on, in Lightroom, I think the, this is the standard background color uh, is this gray. But if you just right click and change it to white, you can now see what it's going to look like when you post it to Instagram. And what we don't want and what you can maybe kind of see over on the left side of the screen here is that that white is kind of bleeding in from the edges. And so I don't want that. I want to see a little bit of separation between the white background and my photo. And so just by bringing this white clipping down a little bit, the whites turn into a slightly more grayish color, but you get a little bit of that separation. Uh, and so now the photo looks really, you know, boxed in and that's, um, that's a good thing. Now we can also adjust the curves of individual RGB channels or of individual colors. And again, I, so I'm not going to get into that, but I really recommend 
that you go and look that up on YouTube, tons of free tutorials out there about that. And then we get into the basic panel and this is where everybody starts normally. And so for me, you know, I'll make sure my white balance is good, get the exposure in there and then the highlights and shadows, but look how much we've already done. And I can show you the before and the after, and we haven't even touched the basic panel yet. And most people spend the majority of their time in the basic panel. And th this just goes to show you how many, like how, how many options there are. Uh, and so from here, I might sort of, I'm just gonna play around with a couple of things here. I like to drop the clarity. So some people like to slam the clarity up to like high levels. And that's a look for sure. Um, and I used to do that. Lately, I've actually been dropping the clarity a little bit. I think that adds sort of a, a really interesting sort of glow. Um, and then dehaze is a new feature, uh, relatively new feature to, to Lightroom, which uh, adds sort of a, a tonal contrast. Um, and if you go the opposite way, it, it well, it does the opposite of dehaze. It, haze, it adds haze. Um, but if you increase dehazing, it just adds this nice contrast. And, you know, I'm someone who really likes that punchy, vibrant uh, look. And that's a creative decision that I've made for myself. Um, and so, you know, it, it's going to be entirely up to you. Like there, you can choose to do a much more sort of monochromatic look and create that consistency across your entire Instagram feed. And so that's something I do want to start to talk about. Of course, before we do that, the most important thing for Instagram is the crop. And so this trick that I'm going to show you is something that changed the way that I do Instagram forever. So I will change it to the four by five crop, which is of course the thing that we need to do for Instagram. And it actually looks like the horizon is a little bit crooked. And so if you click on angle and now we have our, our cursor has this little ruler on it, you can just drag a line across the horizon and it's gonna automatically um, flatten that image for you, um, or sorry, straighten the image for you. So I could crop it like that and call it a day. The trick that I learned is to actually, once you have the four by five crop, then turn it into a one by one crop and see how it looks because this is what you're actually going to see on the Instagram grid. So when you're looking at your, your whole, port, your, your whole uh, feed, this is the square that you're gonna see because it's cropping the top and, and the bottom of your image. And so if you change it to the one by one, and then you just use the shortcut Command Z, or if you're on Windows, Control Z, to undo, then it'll bring it back. And so back to the four by five. So if I select that one by one, I actually don't, I don't like the way that's cropped. There's, in my opinion, there's too much sky and it's cutting off these bushes and stuff down here. And it's just like, it's not a photo. It's not a complete photo in itself. It's not framed properly. And so I try to frame it so that it works well in a square, but also works well in that longer uh, format like this. So I'm just going to then drag this down. And this is where, where editing for Instagram can start to get, you know, a little kind of tricky or annoying is within, you know, operating within these constraints. And so I'm just here and I'm sort of just going back and forth and like trying a couple things out. And so here, I actually really like that. And this actually works really well if you're familiar with the rule of thirds. We have the horizon along the top line, we have the subject along the middle line, and I'm then just perfectly centered. And then we kind of actually have the landscape along um, the right third there as well. 
So that's what that square would look like. Oops, sorry. And then, so once it's cropped like that, Command Z and crop it there. Now, as a photo itself, like just the four by five crop, I would personally prefer it cropped differently, but this is for Instagram. And if we want that look on your feed where the subject is well-placed and you know each photo is well-framed, and if you go and you look at my profile, so if you go to Instagram and you go at Travel Freak, you'll see like the most recent, the 12 or 15 or, or maybe more are all like perfectly framed exactly for this. And then if you go past that, you'll start to see that there's a lot more variation because I haven't earned this trip yet. And it really does change the way your profile starts to look. Um, so, okay. Um, I'm gonna jump back to my presentation. Okay, so here we go. These, you don't have to do it. You can go follow me on Instagram if you want. I would super appreciate it. Uh, but here is an example of, you know, me choosing that square crop for every single photo and making sure that it looks good in a square and also making sure that it looks good in portrait orientation in that four by five crop. And um, you just, and this is a screenshot right from my phone. So this is just, you know, yeah, total game changer for when looking at your feed because it's your feed when people decide whether or not they're going to follow you. And if your feed looks jumbled, they're going to be a little bit less inclined. So some general tips for creating consistency in your photos. So we've just edited a photo. So the easiest way to create consistency in your photos is to have the same subject in each photo or the same, when I say the same subject, it could be the same general idea. So maybe it's a bunch of mountains or maybe it's a person. And um, that's what a lot of more sort of lifestyle Instagrammers and photographers will do. And that's how they manage to create consistency in their feed. It's because it is them approximately the same size in every single photo. And you know, this is for me, like you can see right here, I have people of all different sizes. This is a creative choice that I made. I don't want to do that because I find that it just limits what I'm able to do. And so that's a sacrifice that I've made. And I probably don't get as many followers as I could if I chose to stick to very, very strict guidelines. But I personally just don't want to limit myself in that way. And that, and I'm, I'm okay with that. So again, that's a part of my goal. Whatever your goal is, that's entirely up to you. So um, same general subject in each photo, easiest thing to do. Sort of medium difficulty is shoot during the same time of the day consistently for every single photo. So when you shoot at sunrise or sunset, you have a very different type of light than if you're shooting at high noon. And, you know, when you're shooting in the middle of the day, the, the, the colors look different, they're different shade, uh, the contrast, they're way more contrast um, and sort of in that golden hour light uh, or more diffused light, it's just much softer and there's a lot less contrast. And so you can shoot during the daytime. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. People will tell you, don't shoot during the day. You have to shoot sunrise and sunset. I think that's a stylistic choice. If you want to shoot in the middle of the day, and I know some huge Instagrammers who shoot like 90% of their photos in the middle of the day, you can. That's a part of your consistency. Um, what then starts to get a little bit more difficult, and this is when you start to really become like a master of your craft, is when you start to use the same color scheme in your photos. And so you can see here, and this is something, you know, I mean, look, I'm constantly learning. There's no, nobody's ever not learning new things. And so I recently found I guess I, I stumbled across this shade of blue that I just absolutely fell in love with. And so you can, you can see if you look at these images over here, that that shade of blue is used in all of them. And the way to do that, uh, the way to make sure that you are um, using the same color 
or editing to the same color is with the reference panel. So if you're in Lightroom and um, let's pull up. Okay, so here's a photo from Yosemite that I took about two weeks ago. And down here we have this little icon that says R and then A. And A is just like the photo and then R is your reference photo. So if you do that, and then maybe we pull in, I'm gonna drag and drop this photo here. We can now see two photos right next to each other. And maybe this last photo is also the last photo that I posted on my Instagram. So maybe I wanna see how they're gonna look next to each other. This is one way to do that. And so, you know, in this scenario, maybe I wanna change this color of orange that is, you know, maybe I want to change the color of the light a little bit. And so I might adjust uh, the hue of some of this orange and like turn that a little bit more red. And that obviously looks terrible. It's, it's already where I want it to be. But um, that's how you would compare the two. And so let's say I want to mimic that color blue that's on the left photo onto the right photo. I can keep this here as a reference. And then I can edit the right photo so that I'm uh, like the right most photo so that I am staying consistent with that color. Uh, you can also, if you want to keep sort of like an ongoing grid, I have a collection down here which has my Instagram photos in it. And if you increase your thumbnails to the right size, so that you have three in a row, you can literally see a preview of your Instagram feed right here. And you can reorder, like there's all these apps for, you know, there's there's Later and there's Planoly and there's there are all these different apps. Um, but this is a great way to just do it. And you can say, oh, you know, I wanna drag this and put it here and I think that looks better. Or, you know, you, you can kind of create your own Feed here and here's a little sneak peek of what's coming up so you can do that and then another way that i like to mimic the instagram feed is let's say i'm just gonna select that photo i'm gonna hold down shift and then i'm just gonna go down to like here so i'm gonna select all of these photos and over in the print dialog and this is something you'll have to set up so i've already set it up but across the top we have you know library which is where you view all your photos, your, your, the develop module, which is where you develop your photos. Then there's a bunch of this other stuff that almost never gets touched. But if you go to print, it's literally creating a, you, you're choosing the layout. And so this is how I will deliver creative assets to a client, right? Where let's say I have 20 images and I want to get their approval on them. And so I'll create a contact sheet and I'll send them, you know, a list, you know, maybe, you know, uh, six per page or something like that. But you can create uh, this layout with three rows. Um, and so th that would be down here under page grid where I've got it set to four rows and three columns. So I could, you know, increase that to four columns. That's obviously no longer what Instagram looks like anymore. So we can change what this is looking like, and then we can adjust these margins to sort of mimic what the Instagram grid is going to look like. And so I've just gone and messed it up. But that is a trick that I use for previewing what my Instagram feed is going to look like. Um, another way that you might want to create some consistency in your feed is by synchronizing settings. And this is kind of the same thing as using a preset. So a preset, you know, let's say, Let's see, let's go back to that photo I was editing before. So like, let's say I'm sort of embarrassed with my um, organization of my own person presets, <laughs> but let's say that like, I wanna pick, um, 
Okay, like this one here. Uh, so, you know, I can just click on that and that's a one click edit. So I'm gonna undo that to get us back there. Um, but maybe I want to apply this same, the same edits to this photo over here. So I click the first image, the edited photo first, then I hold down command or I hold down control, depending on what kind of computer you're using and select the other image and hit sync settings. And this button down here lets you choose which options you want to sync from the first image onto the second one. So you can just check all, and that's going to do all your local adjustments. So the, the gradient filter we did, the radial filter, that's all in there. And so we can also turn that off, local adjustments, because this is a completely different photo. So we don't necessarily want that. And maybe we don't, maybe we don't want the same crop on this photo either. So we get rid of that one. And then I just hit synchronize and it doesn't look as good on this photo, but it will at least give me a starting point. And so I can now go in here and maybe I drop the saturation down a whole bunch. And all of a sudden, I really like how this is looking. This just has like a really nice vibe to it. So that's one way. If you have two images that were taken in sort of the same lighting conditions, you can just copy and paste and that's another way you can literally right click on the first image uh, go to develop settings and then copy settings and then you can go to the second image right click develop settings and hit paste settings and that's literally just going to copy and paste and that's doing exactly what a preset is doing um jeremy yes we're right at nine o'clock. So I just right want to make sure you're getting through the rest of your presentation. I know you could probably teach us for days and go through all of this. And it's very, very interesting and valuable, but I want to make sure that you're covering everything that you want to cover. Super appreciate that. This is my very last thing. Uh, and then we'll jump into Q and A. I hope that's all right for you guys. If we go over by about 15 minutes, um, yeah, thanks for, for sticking with me. I hope this is valuable. I hope you guys are learning new things. Um, so if, uh, yeah, okay, so let's jump back in. So if you want to create your own preset, like let's say I've just, you know, uh, edited this photo and I love how this turned out, I can create my own preset in this presets panel by clicking this little plus button, hit create preset. I can choose exactly which treatments in which settings I want to apply. And so maybe like I won't pick the exposure and these things and I'll just call this TNN preset and hit create. And so now, I don't know where it went. Oh, it's under user presets, I think. Yes, and now that preset is right here. And so I could, go to any photo and hit TNN preset. And it's going to apply those settings to that photo. And then I would go and I would make adjustments from there. So uh, we have just gone through most of this um do we have yeah so I basically just powered through all of that uh without using the slides so with that said um yeah let's jump into some q a how's that sound sounds wonderful that was that was great Honestly, I would love to just watch people work all day. It's so inspiring. And also it like when you look at somebody's Instagram and you think they're a great photographer and you think it's just because they point and shoot at the right thing, like you don't realize how much editing goes into making those images so great. And I really think you displayed that just now. So Thank amazing. You. We have a few questions. Um, just 
super quickly because I did chop off the beginning of this recording. Could you remind everyone who's watching this afterwards um, just who you are and, and what your photography background is? Yes, my name's Jeremy. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Travel Freak. And um, I've been photographing, I've been using cameras since uh, I was in high school, maybe before. Wonderful. Um, and you, okay, so also can you explain why shooting in the raw is better than shooting in JPEG form? Yeah, so your a raw file is, um, is like your digital negative. And the best that I can sort of compare that to is you take like a vinyl record and compare it to a CD, right? So a CD is like your JPEG and a vinyl is like your negative. And so when you're shooting on JPEG, you just have a very limited amount of visual information. Uh, like if you think back to what cameras used to be and what film used to be, it was you know a strip of film and you have that little capture on that piece of film. And this, you know, a raw is literally just a digital version of that. And when you were actually in the dark room, you could make adjustments to the contrast and, and everything else uh, because that is actually analog, that film. And so this is like the, the digital negative is uh, the digital version of the analog, if that makes sense. And so you basically, you just have more dynamic range. So you have more that you can work with in the shadows and you have more that you can work with in the highlights. It just gives you more range to play with. And so let's say you shoot too dark or you shoot, which actually you need in some situations, you can bring those shadows up much more if you're shooting in raw than if you're shooting in JPEG. That's a great way to just compare it. I never thought of it as a photo negative. Um, Leo is asking, can you choose that on your iPhone or Android, like shooting in raw or just your camera? Uh, you can. The trouble that you will run into, so, I, so iPhones just recently launched Pro Raw, which um, right in the camera app, you can do that. Android has had it for a while. Of course, this is how it always works with iPhones and Android. Um, but you can choose to shoot in RAW. The, the problem that you'll run into is that the size of the sensor on a, on a uh, phone is so much smaller. So you'll still get a little bit of that extra dynamic range, but the quality of the photo and the quality of that initial like negative that you're getting in the first place is just not going to be as good. Now, that's not to say your phone isn't a great camera because it absolutely can be but it is something to take into account. All right, that's great. Um, great to know. Kristen Smith is asking if all of the features that you were showing us on the desktop are actually available in the mobile app too. Like I know there's a free and a paid version. So for the paid version, would you get all that that you were showing us? So there is, uh, right, so there's the C, so there's Lightroom CC and then there's Lightroom Classic. And so what I was editing in was Lightroom Classic. And Lightroom CC is like their cloud version where everything is synced across the cloud. Adobe is working to bring a lot of those features onto mobile and onto the cloud versions, but it's not there yet. So if you want some of these slightly more advanced features, you do have to pay. Uh, it's $9.99 a month. It's a pretty low barrier to entry. Um, but you know, if you want to get serious about your photography, literally every photographer out there has a subscription to this. So, um, well, I shouldn't say that some people use other software, but like not like 99% of people are going to have a subscription to this. If you're, if you want to take it seriously and, and, you know, if not, that's fine too. It comes back to your goals. Great. Christina is asking, what are your thoughts on horizontal crops for IG? Some photos just don't seem to crop well in the vertical. Yeah, yeah, that's tough. And that's something that I think you, you really have to consider at the time of shooting. And so whenever I shoot, I always shoot for the most part 
wider and taller than I'm going to, than I know that I'm going to need. So if I'm shooting vertically, vertically, horizontal, vertically, I always mix those up. If I shoot, if I'm shooting vertically, I will always leave some extra space at the top and some extra space at the bottom because I know that that's going to have, have to get cropped later on. So I'm thinking about that when I'm actually shooting. Um, and you know, that's tough, especially if you're, you know, shooting for Instagram, you're also shooting for a website or for your portfolio or whatever it is. So you might want to try to capture, and this is where things start to get a little tricky and it can get a little chaotic is capture, you know, a vertical version of that photo for your Instagram and also capture a horizontal version of that photo, maybe for your portfolio, for your website or something like that. Um, but, you know, I'm always sort of envisioning what the purpose of that photo is when I'm shooting it. And I carry that all the way through, through the editing process. That's great. Um, we also have a question about what ratio you would crop your landscape photos at. Is it the same? Uh, is it for Instagram? Yeah. Um, for Instagram, I mean, you, you, can, you can post a landscape photo if you want. And a lot of people certainly do. The four by five crop is what's going to give you the most amount of real estate on the screen. So, you know, when you post that landscape photo, you're going to get this much on a screen that's this tall. And when you post a four by five vertical photo, you're going to get this much space on that screen. So it's up to you. And, you know, that smaller photo may not capture people's attention in the same way a larger one does. So you're just using more real estate and capturing, you know, capturing people's attention with more of your photo being displayed. So, right. so, I mean, to specifically answer the question, it doesn't matter if you're going to post a landscape photo. Uh, honestly, like you want it to be as tall as, as you want it to be as tall as you can get. I didn't even think about that. That's a great point. Um, we have somebody asking, is there a place like Jamaica or something like that where you wouldn't need Lightroom <laughs> where you could just take amazing photos that look great? Yeah, I mean... You can do that on your iPhone. You can do that if you have, uh, you know, a mirrorless or a DSLR. You can. Um, at the beginning, you remember we were talking about how like Canon has its own version of greens. Sony has its own version of greens. So like in camera, you can actually make adjustments uh, to like how it's creating the JPEG. So if you don't want to edit and you want to just take that photo, you can choose a profile. So maybe it's standard or vivid or landscape. Those are some common names for it. And you can just pull the image straight out of camera that way. Awesome. Then we have a question uh, that is asking, how do you organize your photos on your phone, computer, Lightroom? Like, how do you organize it? Yeah, so a lot of people, so there's, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, I do it by day, which exhausts some people. Um, some people do it by destination. So they'll create a folder called Yosemite. And then like every time they go to Yosemite, they'll put, you know, Yosemite one, Yosemite two, Yosemite three. I, I need to see things in a linear time. Um, that's just the way my brain works. And so if we go into my hard drive, like this is going to scare the crap out of you guys, but like, I have literally every single day in 2019 and then like every single day in 2020 that I took out my camera and then like, this is 2018. And so, you know, I have, I've named what each one is, but I organize it all in folders based on a specific day. And so here, you know, I spent three days in Joshua Tree. So I have Joshua Tree day one, day two, and day three. It's a lot, I know. Wow, that is intense. I actually did that two years ago. Oh. And then I tried to look for photos and I had to remember what day I took them on. And I was, it was hard. <laughs> um, you can, but you can also but, search uh, within 
Lightroom. So well, I, I was going to say it wasn't in Lightroom. I was just using folders. So I was like going into every folder and trying to figure yeah. that out. Yeah. Um, we have another question about Lightroom storage. Um, Mary said she's had issues with her catalog being on an external hard drive, and there seems to be a connection problem. How do you prevent catalog crashes with storage on an external hard drive? Yes. Ooh, that's a good question. I keep the catalog itself on my local drive but all the photos on an external drive. And um, that also is just gonna increase the speed that your catalog is able to respond and that like Lightroom will actually interface with the, with the catalog itself because Lightroom and the catalog are on the same drive. If you have the catalog on an external drive, it has to interface through that cable to the external drive. So it's gonna run a lot slower as well. Um, so yeah, so I keep, I keep the, the catalog itself on the local drive and the photos on an external. Great. And that also means, you know, I have, so right now I have two external drives plugged in. So I've got my, this is my local drive, Macintosh HD. Brick two is one of my external drives. That's a four terabyte. And then brick four. So obviously there's a brick one in there and there's a brick three that aren't, they're not plugged in, but I've got nine terabytes of storage plugged in here. So I have one catalog with multiple hard drives. Wow. Um, we have another question about um, catalogs. So Eileen and Mark, uh, previous speakers on TNN, were awesome. asking, uh, we often have a duplicating catalog message come up upon loading Lightroom. Do you know what that means and how to get around it by chance? What's, can you read the error to me? Uh, it just says duplicating catalog message duplicating catalog i'm not sure That's if you want to shoot if you want to shoot me a message i'd be happy to, and uh shoot me a message with a screenshot i'd be happy to dig in there so you go dm him on instagram any of the questions that haven't gotten answered um we also have another question from eileen and mark that are asking they're asking how many photos do you take on average let's say per day because you do it by day and how many of those would end up on your Instagram. <laughs> so, so I take a, I take a lot of photos and, um, it really depends on what I'm shooting. I mean, if it's, if it's a really, if it's a shot that, that where I can like really take my time and frame it and position it and get it set up, then, you know, I'll really work to just get that one shot. If it's, if I'm really like in a run and gun scenario, or if I'm like, shooting for some girls who want to get like the wavy hair and like they want to get their flowy dress in there or something, you know, that requires honestly just like leaning on the shutter. And for me in that scenario, it's not like I just spray and pray. And I hope that they look at one of those photos and they say, yes, I like the way my face looks in that photo. And so, you know, like sometimes that'll end up being like a thousand photos and they'll pick one. Um, so it really depends. Uh, it depends on the nature of the photo and the shooting conditions itself. Um, but I, if I had to put a number on it on average, I might shoot like 500 photos in a day. Wow. Okay. Um, and then we have two last questions. One is, do you prefer to edit on a phone, tablet, or your computer? Computer. I don't edit on my phone um, at all, really. Um, you just don't get the same level of control over the photo. And you know, if you really want to dig into that edit, uh, that's the way to do it. Obviously, your like your phone is way more accessible. You're just not going to have as many options. And this is how I grew up learning. This is you know where you have the most amount of functionality. Um, which isn't to say you can't edit on your phone. You absolutely can. It comes back to your goals and how you want to meet them. Great. Super. Very last question. Sorry. Um, Molly's asking, what are your recommended cameras, lenses, accessories for beginners or for people that are just looking to up their Instagram? That's a great question and a great way to wrap up. All of that information is linked. Um, Erica, I think, is going to send out a copy of the presentation, which also has a couple of things that 
we didn't get a chance to cover today. Um, well, actually, you can. I just put the link in the chat, and so perfect. you can just click the link. It's travelfreak.com slash Lightroom, and you'll get a linked up presentation, and it has all of that in it, right? All linked up on a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> perfect. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up with some TNN announcements. Jeremy, you did an amazing job. While I go through these announcements, I really want to encourage all of you to just drop your Instagram handle into the chat. But this is how you have to do it to make it clickable. Okay, you have to put HTTP colon slash slash Instagram.com slash your handle. Otherwise, it won't be clickable. And who knows if anyone will We'll go ahead into Instagram and type it in. So you can do that now. And I am just going to share my screen one more time. So for those of you who are new here, which I saw a few of you said you were new, um, I just want to let you know where you can find more events. We host tons of events, two to six events a week. So uh, that's at thenomadicnetwork.com slash events. Uh, this Thursday, we have an amazing one on writing, turning your adventures into best-selling novels. Um, and then next week we have one on improv comedy, which is just like, you know, to get you to travel solo better now that we might start thinking about traveling again and maybe to hostels or, you know, if we're traveling solo and want to make friends, this is an awesome event. Um, and then we have on the 16th, Kelly Lewis, who is a travel industry maven, is coming to tell us how to um, plan a killer book launch. She currently has an Amazon bestseller out and it's just in pre-sale. So she is going to be teaching us all of the tricks she learned. And then on the 22nd, we have a uh, fashion designer, Rebecca Jarvie is going to come and teach us about her indigenous life and culture and share with us some of her designs. It's a peek into um, a little bit of Native American history and uh, what what she's up to today. And then on the 24th, we have how to travel solo, but never really alone. Um, it's always a good topic for nomadic Matt readers because he's a huge solo traveler. We also have a few meetups um, that are regional. So go ahead and go to this link and see if you can find your uh, region. You honestly don't have to live there if you just love the Midwest and you wanna show up you're more than welcome to. Uh, we also have an amazing book club every, the first Wednesday of every month, we do a book club where we actually get to invite the author and discuss their book with them. So Helen is going to come. We're discussing Scotland Beyond the Bagpipes. It's one of uh, Matt's recent favorites. Matt will be there too. We would love for you to join us. This is a very unique opportunity. So um, be sure to check that out on the same event page. And then I just wanted to uh, invite you again to our Nomadic Map Plus community where you can get exclusive tips um, on your travels. And again, you can access all the previous and future TNN replays. I I swear I don't cut off the beginning of all of them. So usually they're the full ones. Uh, there are also personal stories that Matt doesn't share anywhere else. Uh, you get to help create content with us and uh, there's books, guides, photos, all sorts of stuff. And so we would love for you to be a part of that community. I know a lot of TNN members are also in Nomadic Map Plus and it's a great way to just up your engagement and be a part of our community team. Um, thank you so much for being a part of tonight. Honestly, Jeremy and I have phone calls all the time, but they're not as exciting as when we have another couple dozen people listening in and, and learning with us. So thank you so much for being a part of our community. We couldn't do this without you. And thank you so much, Jeremy, for taking the time tonight. And everybody connect with Jeremy. You will not be um, sad because he is an amazing person and very generous in his knowledge. So feel free to ask any questions through Instagram DM um, or through his blog. Um, and please download that uh, presentation so you can link, you can find all the links to all of his suggested um, camera gear. Jeremy, do you have anything else you'd like to say? I just want to say thanks to everybody for showing up, for dedicating some time and um... I really appreciate you guys being here. I love seeing people on their photography journeys. I'm definitely going to be checking out all your guys' 
uh, Instagrams here. So much to look through. Very excited for that. So I just want to say thanks for coming today. Wonderful. Have a great night. Thank you so much, TNN. Amazing.